and welcome. The Realty Debate today is going to shift gears from talking just property to talking about the state of urban mobility in our country. Every morning as you reach your place of work, you enter huffing and puffing, frustrated at the hour-long jam you just drove through. Others are narrating tales of their overloaded train ride and the rest, well, they're still out somewhere in a traffic jam. According to estimates, our economy stands to lose some 2 to 5 percentage points in GDP every year due to the time we lose in travelling. But we're not just losing our GDP, we're also losing our minds, it seems. And it's high time that we find sustainable transport solutions for our cities. We're debating today why and how have our cities become such a nightmare on the roads. And joining me on the panel today is Anumita Roy Chaudhary, Executive Director, Research and Advocacy at the Centre for Science and Environment. Dr. Purnima Parida, Principal Scientist and Head Transportation and Planning Division, Central Road Research Institute. Shreya Gadipali, Regional Director, Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. Jyot Chadha, Head Initiative to Catalyze Urban Innovation at Embark India. And the lone gentleman on the show today, Shailesh Pathak, Executive Director, Bharatiya Group. All of you, thank you so much for joining me today. Okay, I want to begin with a quick snapshot of how uh, our big cities are faring when it comes to commuting on the roads and to what extent has public transport become deficient in those cities. Our reporter Lakshmi Sividas is stationed in Bengaluru at, the, at, the busy, at a very busy junction of the city. Lakshmi, give us a quick peek into how bad is it in Bengaluru? Travelling in Bengaluru is every resident's nightmare, especially if they own a vehicle of their own. Just to give you an example, I'm standing here at the busy KR Puram Tin factory junction, where as you can see, it's jam-packed, there is bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, and this is just an example of what happens in all major roads in the city during peak hours. By the traffic police's own estimates, during peak hours, traffic slows down to 15 kilometers per hour on an average in most of these roads. Independent estimates put that about 9.5 kilometers per hour. The big reason for this is the increase in vehicular traffic. It's doubled from 24 lakhs in 2005 to about 55 lakhs today. This also means that most roads in the city are running way above capacity. When it comes to public transport options, citizens have very few viable options. For example, the metro rail is not fully functional, the suburban rail network does not exist, and the BMTC buses are way too expensive for the average man to afford. Okay, uh, Lakshmi, thanks so much for that. Uh, we'll also look at Mumbai now. The city's lifeline is its suburban rail network, which carries some 7.5 million riders each day, making it the most overloaded in the world. Mumbai is building a metro system and a coastal road to decongest the city, but experts say this will serve only a small percentage. Ankita Sinha is joining us from Mumbai on how she sees the situation. Ankita. Now, Mumbai's roads are choking. Over the past decade alone, over 25 lakh vehicles have been registered across the city. And the number is a lot more when you consider the constant influx of vehicles day in and day out. Now, if you look at the roads around this area, they're saturated. But despite that, the construction which is happening here have a completely different story to say. I'm at Lower Parel right now and in this area alone, which is one of the busiest areas in Mumbai, this area has a string of projects with 60-storey plus buildings lined up for the next couple of years. Some of them are Lodha's World Tower, India Bulls, One Avigna Park and even Omkar's 1973. And all of these residential apartments have at least four to eight floors allotted for parking space alone. Now, if you take a look at the impact that this will have on the infrastructure around this area, one needs to realize that action must be taken right now and solution must be found for this. Ankita, thank you for that report. We'll now look at Delhi. The city has one of the world's highest proportions of road area. Uh, its road network spans some 33,000 kilometers and the city has nearly 100 flyovers. And yet the city's transport planners are running out of reasons to pin the blame on for the long traffic stoppages on its arterial roads. The Delhi government is now kick-starting what it calls a massive exercise to redesign its roads that are more than 60 feet wide. As we all heard, they're also going to demolish the existing bus rapid transit corridor in Delhi, but they're not junking this concept for good. They plan to build some uh, 300 to 400 kilometers of BRT corridors, and they're also going to be not going to build any flyovers anymore in Delhi. Okay, so Anumit, I want to begin with you. 
uh, we just looked at how the top three cities, top three metros of our country fared when it comes to the mobility index, uh, if you could call that. Uh, now, there are estimates which say that the motor vehicle ownership in India hasn't reached its saturation level. Uh, it, there are estimates peg it at around uh, 600 plus vehicles for every 1,000 people. Currently, we're only at over 100 vehicles per 1,000 people. So we haven't even reached our peak, and yet we are gridlocked. Right. And that is really the most scary story unfolding in our cities today. And it goes much beyond the whole issue of ownership. People will buy cars, but more important is whether we have the right planning, infrastructure, and the kind of incentive and disincentive package in the city to ensure that even if they are buying, they don't use their car. And that's where we are running into a big problem today. Increasingly, like you've seen in Delhi, even after making so much of road, we are losing and where the people carrying capacity of the road is declining dramatically. Largely because the way our cities are designed today are making most people captive users of car because the cities and the roads are getting designed to facilitate the car movement and allow cars to have seamless and you know the movement with certain speed. That's the obsession that we have in our cities today, which means we are completely disregarding the mobility requirements of people. It is people's need to move that we will have to cater to. Now, as a result, what we're noticing, therefore, that there is a complete disintegration of the way we are designing our roads and the cities, increasing distances for people. And at the same time, if you really look at the impact, just not on the roads, if you look at the impact on the public spaces, you will find that the parking impacts that we're beginning to see because the car also requires a space to be, um, you know, the park somewhere. Okay. And already that more than 10% of Delhi's space has been taken up for parking. Now, right. when you look at all this, this certainly means that we have to completely re-engineer the way we are designing our roads and the cities and at the same time we'll have to make the car owners and users pay the right price for using the road space and public space for okay. the cars. Right. Shreya coming to you so essentially what Anumita is saying that it's not just the increasing volume of cars on our roads that it is the reason for uh, why our cities today are such a commuter's nightmare it's also poor management of traffic and uh, obviously not not at all uh, planning for the future. Uh, you're completely right, and Anumita uh, pointed out a very important point about the issue of parking. Now, uh, you started this whole dialogue with uh, saying that cities should, prob cities can probably have around 600 vehicles per mil per thousand people. That's not set in stone. It doesn't mean that India need needs to reach that point. Uh, definitely, we can have fewer vehicles as long as people's mobility needs are met with. So the primary question to ask is not whether our streets are able to carry the number of vehicles that, they are, that are coming onto the streets, but rather are we providing people the mobility that they need to, that they need, uh, which we clearly not knowing because we are stuck in traffic jams. And this brings us to a very clear point. The more the roads, the more the traffic. Roads attract traffic and parking attracts traffic. Parking is actually a magnet. Wherever you create parking, that's where vehicles come. Imagine a place like Chandni Chowk or you know, South Bombay, where if you do not have parking, you do not actually take your vehicle. Instead, you find some other means of reaching that place. It might be the suburban rail, which is yes, admittedly completely packed, or maybe a taxi or whatever it is, but you don't take your own car there. So the, the point is that we cannot have a future be dependent on car use. We need to look at creating more public transportation. Now, India is pathetic right now, and I use the word pathetic in terms of the supply of public transportation. If you look at rapid transit across the world, France is probably one of the best countries in the world. Per million urban population, France has around 30 kilometers of rapid transit. And rapid transit, I mean, it could be a metro, but it could also be a bus rapid transit or a light, light rail system. It has 30 kilometers per million population, and India right now is at one. It's at a 30th That's of what France very, is. Very different. I want to come to Dr. Parida now. Uh, the Central Road Research Institute has been conducting a lot of studies. Can you put, us, uh, put, uh, put out some figures of facts for us which really lay out the problem, uh, really lay out the wide gap that exists between the demand from commuters and passengers and the supply which is coming uh, from transport services in the country? 
I will start with your own statement that in Delhi right now we are having 33,000 kilometers of roads and almost 90 lakhs vehicles. It's a mismatch. And let me tell you this mismatch can never be, this gap can never be filled up. Because as Shreya is also saying, you provide more roads, you bring more vehicles on the road. So the solution the, is something else which we have to look at. And let me first of all tell you some of the results of the studies we have conducted where the lack of infrastructure, what, what all we are facing or because of our wrong policy, what all we are facing. In Delhi, we conducted a survey in 2002 and it was 5,000 vehicles which were entering the city which were bypassable. And 2009, again we conducted a study and this number has just doubled to 10,000. And still in 2015, we don't have a bypass. We talk of eastern bypass and the western bypass, but it is still under construction. Second, we conducted surveys at ashram intersection in 2005 and the vehicle population was around 2.5 lakh. In 2014, the vehicle population is 4.5 lakh, again doubled. The delays at intersection, it was 180 seconds was the highest while in 2014 it is it has gone up to 386 seconds right. so now you can multiply what is the amount of delay the fuel loss at ashram intersection alone was 31 million rupees in 2005 so in 2015 with all these data and the prices of the fuel gone up you can the, imagine the amount of money that is lost right. in those so, traffic jams. And ashram intersection is having a flyover. So we have tried and to... even that did not solve the problem. Yeah. I want to come to Shailesh now. Shailesh, uh, so uh, we just laid out the problem for you. Uh, but every time there have been some innovative solutions to uh, smoothen, to have seamless traffic on major roads. We've been discussing the case of Delhi in particular. We had the BRT, we're now demolishing that. The KMP Expressway never came, came up. We demolished the Gurgaon toll. Uh, so does this point to this kind of a fatalist attitude or just, just give it up? If it's not working, just instead of fixing it or finding solutions to uh, fix these innovative trans, uh, transit solutions. Thanks, Vasudha. I uh, would like some time because I've been studying this for, a, uh, for quite some time now. And I have taken the Mumbai suburban local between 1986 to 1990. I have uh, uh, spent a long time between Delhi and Gurgaon and I've worked in Bangalore extensively. So uh, your correspondent Lakshmi didn't even start about uh, the Silk Board Junction, which is a legend uh, among my Bengaluru friends, or the Western Express Highway. Uh, when Ankita was talking about Mumbai or the, the Gurgaon Expressway. So I say that, you know, there's a new definition of heaven and hell. Heaven is staying in Gurgaon and working in Delhi. Hell is the other way around. Because every morning on your commute from Gur uh, Delhi to Gurgaon and every evening on your commute from Gurgaon to Delhi, you'll remember the magic words of the National Urban Transport Policy, which was enunciated in 2006. And the magic four words are move people, not vehicles. Now, our problem is that we, we are only focusing on moving vehicles. We are not focusing on moving people. Now, specific examples from within India. The Delhi Metro, to my mind, has done more for women's emancipation in the city of Delhi than any other thing. All you need is a fast, convenient, safe method of moving from point A to B. Now, the Mumbai suburban that was introduced in Mumbai in 1943 was the same as in 1943 was introduced in London, but it did not keep pace. And our misplaced urban priorities are that we spent in Mumbai, we spent about 1200 crores on the Mumbai Bandra Worli Sea Link, which doesn't even see a throughput of, throughput of 10,000 people per day. Two local trains have that kind of throughput. So we should be focusing on how to improve public transport not make cars easier to navigate in. That's number one. Number two, we should be focusing on last mile connectivity. Now, Huda City Metro Station is the Gurgaon Terminal Station. Once you get down from there, you basically risk life and limb to cross the road. 
And if you want to walk to an office which is not more than 500 meters away, it is not possible. We'll talk about how we can disincentivize private vehicle ownership uh, later in the show. I want to come to Jyot Chadda now. Uh, Jyot, we're talking about uh, not just moving cars, but actually moving people. Uh, people, a city needs to give its pedestrians, its citizens a right to walk the streets. Uh, how do we get there? How do we get to planning that way? Thank you for having me, uh, Vasudha, on that show. And I really appreciate everything that uh, my co-panelists have said so far. Um, to, to start with, I'd just like to take a step back uh, and just uh, quote, uh, co uh, make a quote. Um, a progressive country is one not in which uh, poor people aspire to own a car, uh, but rather where rich people even take public transport. And I think that really nicely encapsulates a lot of the discussion that we're having today, right? Whether it's about bus or whether it's about walking, you know. How do we get to uh, a, a place where our transport is accessible, it's fast, it's moving people, not vehicles, it's low on emissions? But I think also it's important to think about, you know, how are we developing transport in cities so that people have multiple options? Not everyone travels the same way. People have different preferences. And so how do we create that sort of ecosystem for our cities? Um, I think on an optimistic note, um, if you look at uh, how our modal split is in Indian cities, um, you know, only about at the maximum about 10% uh, of trips are actually made on cars. The rest is made on public transport, it's made on auto rickshaws and taxis, it's made by cycling and by walking. And, uh, you know, to me, that is, uh, that's a great starting point for us because we're in a position today uh, where we can actually build infrastructure correct the first way around uh, rather than being stuck with legacy infrastructure that a lot of westernized cities are stuck with today, you know, where they have built a lot of infrastructure for cars um, and that is not sustainable from either a person's point uh, of view in terms of the amount of time it takes to commute and it's definitely not environmentally sustainable as well. Uh, Anumita, the Metro Rail project, uh, Delhi, about a decade it's been running. In other cities, it's expanding. Yet, uh, the audience for that, uh, the target, uh, the commuter audience for the Metro uh, Rail in Delhi and other cities, they've just moved from buses. Those going in their cars have not switched to the Metro. Why, why is that so? You know, it's high time that we now begin to understand public transport as a system. It is not a hardware. You need different systems. You need metro, you need bus, you need the last mile. But if it is not interconnected in a seamless way, which enables you to move very easily from one system to the other, to have the shortest direct route from your origin to destination, till that time, you know, that just the hardware of the technology is not going to incite you and attract you to the extent you want them to. So metro is great, but just understand, look at the numbers in Delhi. Wright saying that in 2020, after completion of the, all the phases of metro, metro will still carry only 20% of the travel trips. Now what happens to the rest of the 80%? So imagine therefore the kind of system capacity that we'll have to create for that seamless movement of people. And unless we do that, which means that you need metro, you need also very good buses, you need buses so attractive, not caught in congestion, and that becomes 10 kilometer per hour, which none of us are going to use. Now, the Delhi government is planning to buy 10,000 buses. But at the same time, our very recent assessment in some of the neighborhoods of Delhi is showing, like Chitranjan Park, out of seven bus services there, they've withdrawn six. So just one bus route has remained in that area. Now, you cannot invest and use your and invest money to buy buses, but not improve the service. Public transport is not about the technology, just the technology and the vehicle. It is about a public transport service, which is frequent, reliable, which is attractive. Now, we have to change that mindset of planning for public transport, which is integrated, which enables people to move very quickly from one to the other. And more important is the economic signals that you're going to send. Today, it is, it's so uh, ironical that in this country, we tax the bus more than the car. Now, if at every stage you subsidize the car owner for buying 
and for using the road space, for using the parking, then it's just a loot and free for all that anyone can just now buy a car and drive. Now imagine if today Delhi meets the challenge of moving 25 million trips. Do we expect all these 25 million trips to be on cars? Then just imagine that's the best way to destroy any city. Today out of the 25 million, only 4.5 million trips are being moved by car. And today see how gridlocked we are. So understand also just not these horrific numbers, but also the advantage and the opportunity that you see in these numbers. Okay, and we'll and that is the, the larger share of the people who are still walking, cycling and using public transport. And you need to keep them where they are. Okay, so we look at that aspect of the debate. After a quick break, we've just laid down what's going wrong with urban transport and mobility in our country. We, on the other side of this break, we'll see how we're not planning our urban transport around people. We'll be back after a short break.